very recently we learned that the United States arrested the wife of the infamous drug cartel mastermind El Chapo. El Chapo's wife was arrested very recently. This story came over from the New York Times, and it says here, her name is Emma Coronel Ispuro. The wife of Mexico's most notorious drug dealer trafficker known as El Chapo was arrested on Monday, charged with helping her husband run his multi-billion dollar criminal empire, plotting to break him out of prison after he was captured in 2014. So we have a copy of the whole arrest warrant, the complaint, the affidavit, all of it. And it's, it's pretty interesting. So we're going to go through it. Let's just do a little bit more of the light lifting on the background here. Miss Cornell, a former beauty queen. There she is right there had been under investigation for at least two years by U.S. authorities for being an accomplice to her husband, Joaquin Guzman Loera, who was convicted in 2019 at a trial in Brooklyn for masterminding a huge drug conspiracy, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Court documents filed in Ms. Cornell's case said she had relayed messages for Guzman that help him make drug shipments from 2012 to 2014 and evade capture by the legions of Americans and Mexican authorities that had been, been pursuing him for years. So at his trial, evidence emerged that Miss Cor Coronel was a chief conspirator and a sophisticated plot to break him out of the Altiplano prison by digging a nearly mile-long tunnel into the shower of his cell. And we have some, some sort of details on how this all unfolded in the complaint. It's, it's pretty interesting. She is 31 years old. She's a dual U.S. Mexican citizen. She's got roots in Southern California, city of Culiacan, Mexico, uh, in Sinaloa State. And so they were part of the Sinaloa drug cartel. This was the long serving base of operations for them. Taken into custody at Dulles International Airport near Washington, scheduled to make an initial appearance uh, today on Tuesday in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. Her lawyer, Jeffrey Lichtman, who also represented Mr. Guzman, declined to comment. It's unusual for law enforcement officials to go after the spouses, but she's unlike the other wives of the narco trafficker. She was deeply enmeshed in her husband's criminal business. They introduced Blackberry messages that made clear she had helped uh, El Chapo conduct his operations, sometimes with her own father. She was intimately involved not only in the 2015 tunnel escape, but also in helping him to evade capture after a botched raid in 2012 in the Mexican resort town of Cabo San Lucas. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. I love Mexico. All right. So this is what the Department of Justice says. The wife of El Chapo arrested on international drug charges. He was the leader of a drug tra trafficking organization known as the Sinaloa Cartel. She was arrested today in Virginia on charges related to her alleged involvement in the drug trafficking. 31, dual citizen, uh, on and on and on. We already basically covered that in the news article. So here it is. This is the complaint with an arrest warrant. This was assigned, filed on December, I'm sorry, February 17th in Judge Harvey Michaels Court, United States of America versus Emma Coronel Ispuro. This is an affidavit of Agent, special agent from the FBI, Eric McGuire, in support of an application for a criminal complaint and arrest warrant. He says, I've been a special agent with the FBI since February 2010, been a lead agent for investigations targeting global criminal organization. I've testified in a wide array, got a lot of training, a lot of confidential sources, interviewed hundreds of defendants. I have direct knowledge of international contraband, smuggling, and money laundering. Now it's paragraph one, so we're going to skip over to paragraph three. This affidavit is submitted for the limited purpose of establishing probable cause. So what are they trying to, to say here? What are they going to charge her with? And remember sort of where we're at in the context of this. So uh, this, this is the, the very early part of the case. And right now, all they're trying to do is say, we have enough material, we have enough evidence, we have enough probable cause in order to hold her in custody and bring her in front of a judge. And from basically an arrest warrant, they picked her up, they, they brought her in front of a judge today. We don't know what the final outcome is, but it's the very early part of the case. So this is not all of the evidence is my point. This is not exhaustive. There's going to be a lot more evidence that comes out further down the line, but this is just enough to sort of get her in custody and get her in front of a judge into the next step. So her attorney then can file a, you know, can basically challenge the, you know, all of the probable cause that they're alleging here. But right now, this is enough to keep her in and get her to a judge. So we're not going to go through this in too much detail, but here's what they're claiming at this point. There's a criminal complaint. They're saying this supports a criminal complaint charging her with conspiring to knowingly and intentionally distribute one kilogram of a mixture containing a detectable amount of heroin. So heroin, we got five kilos of cocaine. We've got a thousand kilos of marijuana. We've got 500 grams 
of methamphetamine. And we've also got uh, knowingly bringing this stuff into the United States, knowing and intending that they're unlawfully imported into the United States. So, you know, a, a decent amount of drugs there, but I'm sure there is a lot more where that came from. We're going to skip down to paragraph seven. It says the drug trafficking activities of the Sinaloa cartel, the FBI and the criminal division of the division's narcotic and dangerous drug section have investigated high ranking members of the international drug trafficking organization known as the Sinaloa cartel, including, but not limited to all of these people. So we got Joe Quinn, Guzman, Laura, Laura known as El Chapo, but we also have Lisi, Lis, Licenciado. We also have Menor. We also have Tokaya. We also have Raton. We also have Guero. See how bad my Spanish is. Now, paragraph eight, as a part of this investigation, I have debriefed more than 100 members, former members and associates of the Sinaloa cartel, including but not limited to high ranking associate, associate of Guzman, herein referred to as cooperating witness number one. I've debriefed who I've uh, debriefed personally on dozens of occasions about the drug trafficking and other activities of the cartel. I've reviewed thousands of intercepted wires and electronic communications relating to the drug trafficking activities. So cooperating witness, number one, big, 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 big reveal here, right? This is the undercover, under uh, cooperating witness. This is somebody who is spilling the goods on all of the Sinaloa uh, drug cartel uh, insiders. So this person is, he's, he's, you know, he's kind of playing a dangerous game here, but the FBI is, is uh, going to be protecting him. So that's good stuff. We've got on June 1st, the Office of the Foreign Asset Control designated Guzman as a significant foreign narcotics trafficker designated uh, his son, designated all of these other people in that same category. Paragraph 10, I know from my investigation that Guzman and Sabata were the co-leaders of the Sinaloa cartel from 89 to 2016. They formed the most prolific drug trafficking partnership in the world. They controlled drug trafficking routes from South America to the United States, importing tons of cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, and marijuana. They created an umbrella of security and corruption that permitted other drug traffickers to operate through Mexico. And here's what happened here with cooperating witness number one. They pled guilty to one count of conspiracy to distribute five kilos or more of cocaine. And he or she agreed to cooperate with the government in exchange for a potential reduction in sentence. See how they do that? Happens all the time. If you've got multiple people that you're going to charge with an offense, prosecutors can just pick the, the really big one that they want and they can go around the room and say, all right, look, under the law, we can give you two million years in prison. If you want, you know, one year or two years, you got to give us some good stuff. And then they'll do these things called free talks where you'll just, they'll just sit down and talk. And so this FBI agent, when he said, I've interviewed this person dozens of times, we've had a lot of conversations about this. They're doing free talks. He's that, that, that individual, he or she, they're just talking. So their attorney worked out a deal where they said, my friend, you got to tell them everything. Sit down. So a defense attorney would normally say, you don't talk to them at all. Here they're saying, go wild, right? Because they've already negotiated the deal. What the attorney probably did is they said, hey, uh, what do you know, right? What do you know about this stuff? And this cooperating witness came back down and said, uh, a lot. I know all of this stuff. Uh, came it out. And that the defense attorney said, all right. Here's what we can do if you want to go down this road. And now this person is, you know, high up on the Sinaloa drug cartel or whatever the remnants are of that organization. You know, they are probably a little bit concerned about their well-being and their safety because of this information that is being provided. So uh, that's how that works. And it's going to work out well for that person. They're not going to get a ton of time in prison, but you know, there's, there's, a, there's an exchange there. It goes on, it says, paragraph 17, according to cooperating witness number one, Cornell knew that Guzman was a leader of the Sinaloa cartel. So this is the wife. She knew that her husband, of course, was the kingpin and that he coordinated in the distrib distribution of all this stuff. And also according to cooperating witness number one, she also knew that all of Guzman's sons, here we've got Ivan, Ovidio, Alfredo, Joaquin, were also high-ranking members. So Coronel knew that the husband was involved and she knew that the sons were involved. Very well aware of this. We also knew that she grew up with knowledge of the narcotics trafficking industry. 
She met Guzman, the El Chapo, when she was a teenager. Based on my investigation, I understood the scope of the Sinaloa's cartel's drug trafficking. Cornell knows and understands that the Sinaloa cartel is the most prolific cartel in Mexico. She was aware of multi-ton, multi-ton cocaine shipments, multi-kilo heroin production, multi-ton marijuana shipments, and ton quantity of methamphetamine shipments. It's like straight out of Breaking Bad. Cornell understood the drug proceeds she controlled during her marriage were derived from these shipments. She also knew that and relayed messages on behalf of Guzman in furtherance of the drug trafficking activities. She also helped El Chapo avoid any capture by the Mexican authorities. Once he was arrested in February 2014, she continued to deliver messages that she received from Guzman during her prison visits, which were not monitored by the Mexican authorities. And we have some letters that are actually in this document. Let's get into them. I have reviewed a handwritten letter that was signed by El Chapo. This letter was authenticated by multiple witnesses. And we're going to see here how they're talking in code. And so this cooperating witness, number one, is also corroborating this, this letter. So presumably this person knows, you know, know, knows him well enough to know what his handwriting looks like. Handwritten letter signed, multiple witnesses confirm it, including cooperating witness number one. The FBI has it in control. Here's what the letter says. Regarding Cleto, increase the production so that it yields. Talking in code. Regarding Cleto, increase the production so that it yields. Say hi to Cleto. Tell him to please give me a hand so that the first sale will be my part. Dot, dot, dot. But, I'm sorry, because I have a lot of expenses here. All right, so the FBI special agent says, I know from my investigation that Cleto is a drug trafficker based in Durango. He produces heroin. I know from cooperating witness one, as well as others, that he produced heroin specifically for El Chapo. Guzman's reference to expenses here was a reminder to the recipient of the letter that Guzman had to pay bribes inside the prison and also continue to support his family. I know from my investigation that Cleto and cooperating witness one provided Coronel with drug proceeds for more than five kilograms of heroin. We have another letter. Cornell's participation in Guzman's escape from prison. So if you don't remember this one, this was a wild story. I mean, this, you know, El Chapo is the biggest drug dealer ever. And he was incarcerated and in a Mexican jail. And then he escaped. <laughs> and nobody knew what the hell happened. Turns out they dug a tunnel literally a mile long under the prison up into his shower. And the guy escaped right under the noses of the Mexican authorities. And so... It's, it's looking like Coronel helped him do that. And so did his four sons. So this is a whole thing is a family affair. Let's dive into this letter. Based on my knowledge and the investigation of debriefing of multiple former cartel members, Coronel visited Guzman at the Altiplano prison on multiple occasions following his arrest in 2014. I have reviewed a handwritten letter written and signed by El Chapo. This letter was authenticated by multiple witnesses, also in evidence. The letter contains detailed instructions about the ongoing operations of the cartel, including narcotics transports. The letter also states in pertinent parts, I ask you always to be in agreement among you and my four sons. Hire accountants throughout the state and pay the guys and widows from there. And whatever is left per month, half is for you and half is for the four of them. You know who has the papers from that place. Send them to the twins, please. The twins mother will tell you and my children something. Please be alert, compadre. She will explain. The twins mother will bring a message to all of you so that you all see it personally. Right. Different code letter. Based on my knowledge of the investigation, I understand my four sons to be Ivan, Alfredo, Ovidio, and Joaquin. And I understand the twins' mother to be Coronel. Based on the letter quoted above in my knowledge of the investigation, I believe that Coronel was acting as a go-between and messenger between Guzman and his lieutenants, associates, and sons. I further understand that Guzman, as El Chapo, continued to direct the drug trafficking activities of the Sinaloa cartel from the prison, including with the help of Coronel. Then we get, this is where we get the explanation. We're going to have like two more slides on this and then we're done. Here it says, according to the cooperating witness, Guzman, through Cornell, asked Guzman's sons to purchase a piece of land near the Altiplano prison and instructed cooperating witness one, so somebody close to them, to purchase a warehouse near Altiplano prison as well as firearms and an armored truck. So El Chapo is in prison right now. And they're buying up land around it. They're buying up firearms and an armored truck. Those present also discussed the need to get a GPS watch to Guzman in prison in order to pinpoint his exact whereabouts so as to construct the tunnel with an entry point accessible to him. 
According to CW1, he later met with Cornell to discuss the Altiplano prison escape plan. They provided updates to Cornell to pass on to Guzman. So he was he was literally uh, planning his escape through his wife, also through his sons. According to Cooperating Witness 1, he or she met again with Guzman's sons to discuss the escape plan. The sons reported to Guzman. He could hear the tunnel construction. Uh, Guzman's sons reported that Guzman could hear the tunnel construction and that the escape would be on a Saturday or Sunday because there are no officials or visitors at the jail on those days. According to Mexican authorities, on July 11, 2015, Guzman escaped from the Altiplano prison via an underground tunnel with an entry under the shower of Guzman's cell. It's like, a, a, why is this not a Hollywood movie? I do not know. Conclusion, based on the foregoing facts, I respectfully submit that there is probable cause to believe that from at least in or about 2014 and at least on or about January 19th, 2017, Cornell, the wife, knowingly, intentionally, willfully conspired with Guzman to distribute all of those drugs. We already talked about them. Heroin, five kilos of cocaine, 1,000 kilos of marijuana, 500 grams of meth, and knowingly importing those things into the country, signed off on by Eric S. McGuire, special agent of the FBI, digitally signed and approved on by this judge, Honorable G. Michael Harvey, out of the D.C. Federal District. So, uh, an interesting case. Wanted to just run through that. I think it's it's one that might be might be interesting to follow along. So we'll see what that looks like. I think that the evidence here is probably overwhelming. You know, these two people have been on the run for years and uh, you know, it's, it's a good thing that they're not importing all of those drugs into this country because drugs are bad. All right, let's jump into the question. We have Rob, is it really wrong for his wife to do that? I think not. And surprise, you're talking about it. I know some of the bikers, I know some bikers, if you want to talk about them too, just kidding. Also, would you defend a high profile case like this. Yeah. So, he's surprised that I'm talking about it. Um, maybe, maybe because the Sinaloa, listen, I'm not trying to offend the Sinaloa drug cartel. All right. We're, uh, we're defense lawyers. Okay. We're kind of, we help your side, <laughs> not the other side. So don't get mad at me for talking about it. But, uh, but yeah, I would absolutely handle a high profile case like this. I think everybody deserves a defense. Everybody. If the government has its ducks in a row, if they have the case in order, there's very little that a defense attorney can do, right? I mean, I mean, truly, if, if everything is fine with the government's case, then there's very little that a defense attorney can do. The issue here, which is why we have a job and a thriving business is because the government's case is not always in order. Mostly it's not. They screw up a lot and because they get sloppy, because they think that it's sort of in the bag and they don't do things by the book because of a lot of other problems. So, you know, I, I, I do think that you know, I, I don't endorse smuggling drugs into the United States just because I would represent somebody in a high profile case like this does not mean that I endorse what they do, but I do endorse the presumption of innocence. I do endorse the uh, due process concepts that we have here that are, I think, foundational to justice. And in order to make sure that the justice system continues to move forward and that the government continues to be held accountable, I would absolutely represent uh, somebody like this. No question about it. And so a couple good questions there. Thank you for those. 